Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, Shanika Ratnayaka, Director and Chief Executive Officer of Great Place to Work Institute, is in the studio today to provide her insights on a range of issues relating to the HR sector in Sri Lanka. The LMD Nielsen Business Confidence Index slumped by 13 basis points in August. Nielsen's Managing Director, Sharang Pant, discusses the reasons for the downturn. And in our final segment, Mihirani Disanayaka, the Country Manager of Kanta TNS, analyzes the results of their survey on the real estate market in Colombo. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to the Big Picture Business Program Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. Today we are focusing on human resources and we've invited the Chief Executive Officer of the Great Places to Work Institute, Shanika Ratnayaka, to provide her insights on issues relating to HR uh, and also people in Sri Lanka in the HR sector. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Savitri, for having me here. Now, <coughs> what is your broad take on the current, uh, current status of the Sri Lankan workforce? Okay, so that's quite a loaded question, but uh, I'll try to answer it in, in, in multiple forms. Some of it will be backed by some data, but others will be a more generalistic approach to the market. Um, so this is known to be what we call a talent economy, right, this current era. And uh, we in Sri Lanka know that our human capital is our most valuable resource. Um, unfortunately, however, we have a short supply. Uh, of good talent, right? There is talent in all forms, but uh, good talent is hard to come by. And so therefore, there is seems to be a constant war or haggling in the corporate sector for this limited uh, resources or the limited good talent. Mm. This ends up in, uh, typically there are being uh, awakened, uh, put some positions open for a long, a long time or you are unable to actually fulfill those roles or uh, sometimes expats being brought in to some of these key roles. Uh, and on the other side, we also see that um, uh, organizations or corporates pay uh, crazy uh, salaries uh, or remuneration packages uh, in order to fill those roles. On the other hand, for the lower end of the spectrum, we find that there's a severe shortage of talent, right? Here we are talking about skilled uh, or trained talent. Um, and then corporates are slow to pick up uh, that group of people and as a result, um, you know, we have, uh, even though the unemployment rate is only 4.4% uh, according to the Census and Depa uh, st Statistics Department, we have the youth uh, unemployment at about 18.8% uh, because even the people coming out of schools uh, and the graduates from the university program uh, are not really ready uh, to for the workforce, right? So they're not work ready is what we call them. So lots of organizations end up having to uh, spend a lot of time and money in uh, providing that basic amount of uh, skills that are ready to make them, uh, re required to make them job ready. Just getting to this youth mm. unemployment mm. 18 plus percent. Um, Shanika, we have been talking about this unemployability mm. of young people mm. coming out of university or even schools. Sure. For decades, yes, but somehow nothing seems. Uh, to I happen. don't know. The yes. It doesn't seem to be addressed. Yes, so I think um, that has a lot to do with uh, our education system. I mean, I think that also is a known factor, starting with the way uh, we study or we learn uh, from our, our secondary education, uh, where it's a case of learning the textbook uh, and studying for exams. It's a case of passing exams as opposed to gaining knowledge. Um, through broader learning, through research or through doing projects or other aspects of learning. Um, then we go to the university system, which is limited to a very few um, because uh, we, we don't have the capacity to take on more. And that is more of the same, right? So kids come out, we have brilliant uh, students coming out in terms of uh, intellectual capability, uh, but they do not have any um, ability to uh, connect with the work environment uh, day one. They don't have the required soft skills, right? So you get, uh, for example, in our environment, we look for people with, from the sciences with uh, statistics and physical sciences, uh, but they don't, they're not able to take that, that basic education 
and you know, they don't have the required uh, communication skills, the ability to take on their analysis capability, uh, to communicate how you would present those results to people. So that is a big problem for the work environment. So, so I think it has to change really at uh, at the training level, secondary and tertiary levels as well. Tell me, it's <coughs> the private sector mm -hmm. that needs these employable young people. So why aren't they taking the initiative? Actually, it's, it, we, we cannot limit it to the private sector. Yes, I, th I think the public sector needs them as well. Uh, however, it's a, it's a private sector that is looking for more of these employable uh, people because uh, the rest get put into the public sector anyway. Uh, also, those coming out of uh, the local university system by default look for employment in the public sector because one, they think it's easy to compete, they get in based on their results and uh, how they have uh, graduated or what uh, uh, education qualifications they have achieved and not necessarily are they tested for the soft skills or have to prove themselves in those spaces. So the private sector is doing a lot, right, but uh, it comes at a cost and it doesn't happen fast enough that conversion uh, doesn't happen fast enough, I believe, for them to be able to show results or the productivity and efficiency they require from uh, this p force 18% uh, or the 10%, whatever is joining the private sector uh, from those who are coming out of our local uh, schools and uh, universities. Uh, they struggle even after a degree to be able to compete with those kids who have been uh, managing both professional education and work uh, simultaneously. Uh, Shanika, uh, what young people, current day young people look for when they are seeking employment? Uh, first and foremost, they look for the big brands, right? The, non the companies that have the big brand names, whether it's the Dialogues or the Levers or the Brand Xs of the world, right? Because um, they believe uh, quite correctly that it is good on their CVs, right? So it is not a case of building a career, but what will look good for me in my next job. Uh, the second aspect is salary. And this, I think, our private sector is partly to blame for because we go directly to campus uh, to hire the best of graduates or directly to schools and institutes. And um, so they position their brand there and then they give them a package uh, which sometimes only the bigger companies can kind of uh, uh, offer to start with. And uh, these individuals, the, the brighter or the more qualified or the more suited employees get picked up. Uh, even before they graduate, which is a system in, in more developed economies as well. Um, uh, but as a result, they start uh, looking for that uh, as, as by default, as opposed to maybe uh, things that we profess like culture and uh, whether there's a good working environment, whether there's an opportunity to grow in career, whether this is an innovative uh, um, environment, whether you can have an entrepreneur streak here. What are the other aspects that you might want to develop in the individual? So irrespective of what your background is or what you might be wanting to do or study, you will look for that package as we call it, you know, the high pay and title, amazingly title, right? Some of these kids come out of college and want, uh, they look to see how quickly or whether I can start day one in a manager with a manager title, right? They have no clue about even managing themselves, leave alone managing other people or projects. What practices should organizations have in, in situ to retain that talent? The first thing is attracting right talent because becomes important because in that whole attraction process, they have to um, look for more than just skill, right? Yes, we talked all this uh, while about whether we have the required skill. Um, but uh, when it comes to retaining, it becomes important to also have looked for what we call fit, good fit. Right. Otherwise, it becomes a case of I take you, I train you, I spend the money, I invest in you, two years down the line, you're gone. Right. Now, I know that is more of what happens with the uh, Gen Y uh, in this day and age. But nevertheless, uh, the organization makes an investment and they have to start seeing a return on that investment, not in just hiring the best skills, but what they might put uh, to bring on the skills required for them to do their job in that particular environment. Right. So now this is challenging. Already you have a short supply of good talent. Right? Then, you're, then you're looking for people who also have to have the correct behaviors that match up with their value system. So um, they need to put those practices in place that they can actually measure or find those values. Or in the event you cannot find those by default, how do you inculcate or develop those values in people? So this is where HR really has a key role because uh, they can do a lot by defining good practices in the organization. Um, so that 
uh, values get converted to. We say it is important to have a, a good EVP or an employer value proposition in order to attract that talent. And then uh, you build those behaviors around the people. So you invest in training people through uh, good practices uh, to ensure that they live those values, their behavior. Uh, is uh, mold into that of that organization. What exactly, very briefly, is the role that a people manager plays in the organization? Well, I think uh, uh, we, we believe strongly that the people manager I is, uh, is the most key aspect because um, practices are really like, like policies. You set it at, a, at an organization level or values of an organization. Those who deliver that uh, experience to the rest of the team members, employees, um, uh, basically that implementation of that comes through the people manager, right? So he, he or she is really the linchpin or the connect between what an organization puts in place uh, as their values and practices and what gets implemented uh, on the ground. And take for one uh, uh, practice like work-life balance. Um, some organizations have very good um, uh, practices on work-life balance on paper. Right. So you can work from home, virtually anywhere, flexible hours. But when it comes to implementing that um, in the work environment, some managers, I won't say all, uh, may have issues with uh, if you do not see uh, your entire team in office from 8 in the morning till 8 in the evening, you know, long after working hours, running the AC, lights burning, uh, you believe that he or she is not working. right? Um, whereas uh, it is about doing your work from wherever you are and uh, being able to deliver the required results. So it's, it's, uh, it's a mindset issue, right? So no matter w how good your policy is on paper, if that manager is not first and foremost trained or doesn't have the required behavior to be able to adapt and get the best out of his employee by allowing him or her to work from any environment or in flexible terms and get the job done, uh, as opposed to saying, uh, you know, you're not in office, so obviously this is not happening, uh, then the implementation of that practice is weak. We pause for some commercials now, and on the other side, we have Shanika Ratnayaka discussing about creating diversity in the Sri Lankan workplace and also the main hurdles facing Sri Lanka in retaining its talent. Stay with us. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcasts, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. We understand that savings provide for life's special moments. That's why we were the first bank to introduce an incentivized savings scheme, Pathum Vimana. We changed how a nation felt about savings because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Thank you for staying with Benchmark. Let's return to the Chief Executive Officer of the Great Place to Work Institute, Shanika Ratnayaka. We are discussing human resources and I'd like to begin, Shanika, this second segment asking you, creating diversity in the workplace is almost a business imperative. That culture of inclusion is um, definitely a dynamic that drives business. But how are organizations actually 
practicing this and how best do you achieve this objective? Yes, uh, you're quite right, Savidya. Uh, first, I think what organizations need to do is invest in building an inclusive culture itself, right? So that is not uh, a given uh, day one. Um, uh, the world is changing and, and what we uh, mean by inclusive is also quite different, right? So it is not just about gender diversity. Uh, it is about um, several other factors including race, religion, uh, sexual orientation, uh, multiple uh, aspects of the way people work, uh, what they bring to the organization. Um, so lots of um, different aspects need to be looked at. People also talk about uh, differently abled, um, how do they uh, get included in that workforce, do organizations have policies and practices to include them. And those are some things that we measure as well. So uh, in general, I think um, what needs to be done or what organizations are doing at the moment is uh, gender wise, I think, uh, I mean, we all know there is the gender divide, but more and more uh, women, at least in the corporate sector, uh, are, 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 in, are, are working and, and organizations uh, do have the practices to encourage people, uh, women to work um, in all, all kinds of, all forms of jobs. However, um, I think what we need to encourage is um, methods to bring women back after maternity, uh, give them things like flexi hours or other aspects uh, to allow them to come back to work after um, uh, taking some time off due to childcare or marriage or certain instances like that. Because uh, we find that a lot of them are losing out uh, on the abundance of qualified women or who have already been in the workforce maybe after university or as school leavers once they're professionally qualified uh, due to marriage or child rearing they have uh, given up uh, working but are available to work uh, if the organizations can find ways of uh, including them in their workforce. So here what we say is make, make the culture as inclusive as possible on all fronts, right? Not just uh, gender, because when we talk of inclusiveness, everybody says, okay, we have put in place, you know, all of these facilities to make it possible for women to work. Whether it's late hours, they will have things like transport facilities, uh, people will have uh, early shifts for women to uh, work and make it possible for um, that aspect. But uh, I think we need to take it a step further as well. For example, uh, you need to have environments in which possibly um, they can nurse or they can uh, take time off for the need uh, need to uh, nurse or, or to be able to bring in a child to the work environment. Uh, some organizations provide uh, creches or other facilities for child caring or we have to have a support system whereby um, parent, uh, women are able to keep their uh, children in child care facilities. Uh, while they are able to pursue their their careers. Um, on the front of other um, areas of inclusiveness, for example, we are talking about uh, disabled or different able people. Uh, most organizations do not even have disabled access, right. Uh, if you walk into an environment, uh, you have to use stairs or lifts, so how do you get into these premises if you are disabled. Um, if you look at canteens or washrooms, uh, they do not have disabled access. So then you cannot just have it in your policy manual or your practices that, you know, we uh, are an equal employer. Uh, equal employer really has to live its true um, meaning uh, by saying you are equal for all types and all abilities and disabilities as the case may be, if you want to benefit from those situations. And there are lots of disabled people who can contribute. When you look at Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. we have been experiencing brain drain and this goes even for the young people. Uh, what can Sri Lanka do to retain its HR talent? We can uh, keep good talent if we are able uh, to compensate them based on how they are performing and uh, providing, you know, doing performance review and uh, inc increments and, and um, promotions to um, make sure that they are actually embracing a performance based culture. Right, because key talent goes when they are not recognized uh, or they don't 
they don't see the opportunity to grow within that organization because you know uh, they haven't got the seniority in the organization or anyway everybody is getting a 10% increment in the organization it doesn't matter that i brought in 80% of the profit the 820 rule might apply right so if it if you're driving a performance based culture you are able to actually keep your key talent pay them well incentivize them right and uh, basically recognize these special people um, in a way that they will actually stay in country and not n not have to go out looking for that recognition or that capacity to earn uh, what their talent might be uh, able to get in in a foreign country right. so I, lots of people i talk to as to why they actually migrate or go for jobs abroad um, the belief is that uh, in Sri Lanka, however much you own, you really cannot own an asset, right? For young people who are starting off in their 20s and 30s, you know, they want to own their house, they want to own their car, not just a corporate car or, you know, a rented house. And it is difficult on the salaries that they earn. You know, you did touch earlier on work-life balance. But let me ask you something. In this day and age of technology, where you're contactable anytime, anywhere, no matter where in the world you are, can you really infuse that concept of work-life balance? Yeah, so actually it works both ways, right? Um, in the sense, as you said, you know, you're never really off duty, right? You can be contacted, you're connected, uh, there's really no downtime, whether it's your personal time or whatever. Uh, but on the other hand, the benefit is that you can actually opt to take um, 9 to 10 uh, at the gym, right? Uh, when technically in, in the good old days that would have been prime working time. N I'm, I'm talking about 9 to 10 in the morning. But you may actually be on call on a virtual, you know, on a conference call with uh, the US uh, from 9 to 10 in the night, which normally would have been your personal time, right? So what it gives us is the ability to be um, flexible about how we use that day. It doesn't necessarily mean while yes, you are contactable 24 hours, you need to be on call 24 hours. They want to be able to be at work or doing what they have to do uh, when they want to do it, but still get the job done. And therein lies uh, the answer, I think, as the important thing is to ensure that the job is getting done, the objectives are met, you're delivering on what you have been asked to put in. Uh, not how much about how that is getting done or when that is getting done, but within that time frame that is allocated, um, it is about what is getting done, the quality of your work, the nature of your work. What are your projections for the future of HR? Uh, HR uh, here still has a long way to go. Uh, I think one of the dilemmas is that HR is still not strategic uh, in the context of the boardroom and senior leadership. Uh, it is not perceived um, as seriously enough uh, as would be finance or marketing um, where they have board positions and they have a lot of influence uh, on the strategy that is set for the organization. Um, there was a study done uh, I think by uh, MTI some time back uh, on what CEOs thought um, the HR people could contribute to the organization and 90% of CEOs did not believe that they are HR heads or they are key HR people actually um, could earn a board position, right? Because they did not think they had the required business acumen or the overall knowledge of things like finance and marketing. It's not, you can't isolate it, right? Uh, that was required to drive the uh, goals and objectives and the strategy of the organization. Similarly, uh, the same study told us that 40% of people in HR themselves believed that uh, they would not make it to the boardroom because of this perceived notion, uh, negative uh, notion that uh, they were not good enough or they were not doing enough. Right. So here I think really, I mean, you have both situations. Um, what do we need to do to correct that? Because um, if human resource is our most important asset, then it is key that uh, HR starts to be strategic. Right. It has to be strategic human resource management as opposed to personal management, which most often is what is happening in organizations. There's payroll, there's personal files, there's uh, issues being resolved, um, you know, appointment letters being given, exit interviews being done, hiring being done. That is all rather archaic. Right. 
So we need to start driving it at a strategic level and how uh, they need to do that is by adding value or showing how what they do or the work that they do really adds value to the business. Right? Then CEOs and organizations and stakeholders start to take HR seriously. Lots of food for thought there for HR people, I believe, and also maybe the organizations in general. Sure. Thank you very much, Shanika, for chatting with us today. We've been discussing HR with Shanika Ratnaika, the Chief Executive Officer of the Great Place to Work Institute. We'll be back with more, and Anushan Selvaraja is on the other side. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcasts, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. Nearly 60% of all businesses in our country are SMEs. Some of our most growth-oriented financial solutions have been customized to serve this sector. That's why we have invested over 500 billion rupees to support the backbone of our economy. Because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Welcome back to the show, I'm Anushun Selvaraja. Now for a close look at the latest on the Business Confidence Index. Joining me is the Managing Director of Nielsen, Sharan Pant. Welcome back to the show, Sharan. Now, the BCI, it's been a bit volatile as of late now. Uh, what are the reasons behind this? Uh, in the last four months, we've seen big fluctuations. It moved from 115 to 134, came down to 122. Now, despite the fact that inflation is stabilizing, taxes on a few uh, items are being reduced, we see this fluctuation and we feel this is more of a knee-jerk reaction to the communication uh, or the corruption issues that are propping up. Uh, so it's, it's more an impulsive reaction rather than any reaction to long-term trends is what we feel. So what is the pulse of the business community when it comes to our economy? Now this number has come down significantly in the last two or three months. It stood at 1 in 4 or around 28% in the month of July. In the month of August, this was around 20%. The government came up with its Vision 2025 document. It talks about where it wants to see Sri Lanka in the next 8 to 10 years. There are certain policies being announced, but we feel the business community or the consumers want to see some immediate action on the ground, which is why we see these sentiments moving up and down significantly. Now, Sharan, only a few people have been positive about our investment climate. Now, to your understanding, what could be the reasons behind this? If I talk about what's driving this, uh, so despite, again, taxes, inflation being stable, the performance of businesses has not been all that good. FNCG is struggling. We know that the growth, or rather the decline, is uh, there of about 2% quarter on quarter. Tourism is struggling. So, though the overall growth in uh, arrivals in the first seven months is about four percent if we look at four months out of these seven there has been a decline compared to last year uh, same is the case with remittance now remittance forms a big way of uh, discretionary income or disposable income for sri lankan households the overall remittance in the first five months of 2017 dropped by seven percent impacting the ability of certain households, specific households, to consume a few things and that's reflected in the consumption growth as well. Having said that, there are still some positive signs when it comes to exports. Exports have gone up by 5%, but exports in apparels have in fact declined by 5%. What it basically means is that the impact that GSP Plus was expected to have, that has not yet set in. Could you shed some light on the issues that we need to watch out for for the BCI going forward? 
So uh, one is obviously how certain policies are being formulated by the government in the upcoming uh, uh, budget for 2018 which is coming up in the next two months or so. Uh, the positive news is uh, Vision 2025 has been taken to various stakeholders both government and private stakeholders. There are, being, uh, there are interactions being organized for the private uh, sector to give its comments, give its inputs which will hopefully be incorporated into the budget. Uh, so that needs to be watched out how the budget framework comes up in the next two months which will shape the way BCI or even consumer confidence will move. At the same time, there are other aspects which I have spoken about in the past as well. Uh, policy on higher education, whether it's medical or technical, that needs to be clarified. There are investment proposals waiting in those sectors and the investors are holding back to see what happens on these aspects. Uh, the businesses are holding back on investing in workforce because they are yet to see the GSP plus driven orders to come in and once that comes in the efficiencies need to be brought in and the workforce might increase. So uh, apart from inflation, taxes, these are the other things that will be watched out for in the next few months. Thank you for joining us Sharan. Thank you. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Sharang Pant. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcast, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Gami Pubudua, our microfinance offering, makes it possible for the youth of this country who have a viable business plan but lack the funds to realize their dreams. We are committed to grassroots level entrepreneur development because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Welcome back to the show. I'm Anushin Selvaraja. Now for a closer look at the latest on the LMD Kanta TNS survey. Joining me is the country manager of Kanta TNS, Mihirani Pisanayaka. Welcome back to the show, Mihirani. As usual, now just give us a brief overview of the survey. Okay, Anushan. The topic this month uh, that we have chosen for the survey is about the real estate, uh, how it is developing in the country and how people in the country see the development uh, of the sector. So how do respondents view our real estate sector? Uh, it's interesting to see 7 out of 10 people see the sector is booming and uh, growth is really aggressive 
and uh, to the level uh, in which the sector is not able to uh, meet the demand uh, this is that kind of a perception the people have about real estate uh, sector growth on the other hand uh, two out of ten people believe that uh, it is not showing that uh, aggressive growth uh, because they don't see good properties coming out uh, in the vicinity to them now Mahira, do they believe that property bubble is being created and if, if so if this bubble uh, bursts is our market capable of handling it? Some kind of perception is there. If you look at the survey results, 38% of people who we interviewed believe that there is a risk attached to this uh, entire growth. Uh, two reasons uh, that they are coming up with. One is that uh, economy is not strong enough to support this growth. On the other side, uh, people in the country won't have that financial uh, ability to, you know, uh, invest money in real estate. So these are the two reasons uh, that they are uh, bringing to see the risk uh, of, you know, uh, crash in this, uh, you know, growth in the real estate market. On the other side, uh, four to six percent who we interviewed believe that uh, there's not much risk attached to this. Uh, because they are seeing, uh, you know, demand is there at the same time, value attached to the property with people in the country is creating the demand for the sector and hence they were, there won't be a uh, such crash that they are, they are going to see in the future. Do respondents believe that uh, property prices here in Sri Lanka are fair? Uh, yes, Anushan, half of the sample we interviewed uh, seem to be having the perception that the price is fair, the properties in the city. Uh, on the other side, uh, some one segment is believing that uh, property prices is uh, beyond the price that the people can afford to in this country. Thank you very much for joining us, Mihirani. Thank you, Anushan. That was the country manager of Kanta TNS, Mihirani Disanayaka. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.